Chapter 18 of The Red and the Black, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red and the Black, Volume 1 by Stendhal. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter 18. A King at Verrieres. Do you not deserve to be thrown aside like a plebeian corpse which has no soul and whose blood flows no longer in its veins? Sermon of the Bishop at the Chapel of St. Clement On the 3rd of September at 10 o'clock in the evening, a young dame woke up the whole of Verrieres by galloping up the main street. He brought the news that His Majesty the King of would arrive the following Sunday, and it was already Tuesday the prefects authorized that is to say demanded the forming of a guard of honour they were to exhibit all possible pomp an express messenger was was sent to verger monsieur de renal arrived during the night and found the town in a commotion each individual had his own pretensions those who were less busy hired balconies to see the king who was to command the guard of honour Monsieur de Renal at once realized how essential it was in the interests of the houses liable to have their frontage put back that Monsieur Moreau should have the command. That might entitle him to the post of first deputy mayor. There was nothing to say against the devoutness of Monsieur de Moreau. It brooked no comparison, but he had never sat on a horse. He was a man of thirty-six, timid in every way, and equally frightened of the falling and of looking ridiculous. The mayor had summoned him as early as five o'clock in the morning. You see, monsieur, I ask your advice as though you already occupy the post to which all people on the right side want you want to carry you. This is a, In this unhappy town, manufacturers are prospering. The liberal party is becoming possessed of millions. It aspires to power. It will manage to exploit everything to its own ends. Let us consult the interests or the king, the interests of the monarchy, and above all the interest of our holy religion who do you think monsieur could be entrusted with the command of the guard of honour in spite of the terrible fear with which horses inspired him monsieur de moreau finished by accepting this honour like a martyr i shall know how to take the right tone he said to the mayor there was scarcely time enough to get ready the uniforms which had served seven years ago on the occasion of the passage of a prince of the blood at seven o'clock, Madame de Renal arrived at Verger with Julien and the children. She found her drawing-room filled with liberal ladies who preached the union of all parties and had come to beg her to urge her husband to grant a place to, the, of, to theirs in the guard of honour. One of them actually asserted that if her husband was not chosen, he would go bankrupt out of chagrin. Madame de Renal quickly got rid of all these people. She seemed very engrossed julian was astonished and what was more angry that she should make a mystery of what was disturbing her i had anticipated it he said bitterly to himself her love is being overshadowed by the happiness of receiving a king in her house all this hubbub overcomes her she will love me once more when the ideas of her caste no longer trouble her brain an astonishing fact he only loved her the more the decorators began to fill the house. He watched a long time for the opportunity to exchange a few words. He eventually found her as she was, be she was coming out of his own room, carrying one of his suits. They were alone. He tried to speak to her. She ran away, refusing to listen to him. I am an absolute fool to love a woman like that, whose ambition renders her as mad as her husband. She was madder. One of her great wishes which she had never confessed to julian for fear of shocking him was to see him leave off if only for one day his gloomy black suit with an adroitness which was truly admirable in so ingenious a woman she secured first from monsieur de moreau and subsequently from monsieur the sub-prefect of moron an assurance that julian should be nominated a guard of honour in preference to five or six young people the sons of very well-off manufacturers of whom two at least were models of piety monsieur de valenod who re reckoned on le lending his carriage to the prettiest women in the town and on showing off his fine norman steeds consented to let julian the being he hated most in the whole world have one of his horses but all the guards of honour either possessed or had borrowed one of those pretty sky-blue uniforms with two silver colonel epaulettes which had shown seven years ago 
madame de renal wanted a new uniform and she only had four days in which to send to besancon and get from there the uniform the arms the hat etc everything necessary for a guard of honour the most delightful part of it was that she thought it imprudent to get julien's uniform made at verrieres she wanted to surprise both him and the town having settled the question of the guards of honour and of the public welcome finished the mayor had now to organise a great religious ceremony the king of did not wish to pass through barrier without vis visiting the famous relic of saint clement which is kept at bray le haut barely a league from the town the authorities wanted to have a numerous attendance of the clergy but this matter was the most difficult to arrange monsieur maslon the new cure wanted to avoid any price the presence of monsieur chalon it was in vain that monsieur de renal tried to represent to him that it would be imprudent to do so monsieur the marquis de la mole whose ancestors had been governors of the province for so many generations had been chosen to accompany the king of he had known the abbe chalon for thirty years he would certainly ask news of him when he arrived at verrieres and he found him disgraced he was the very man to go and rout him at, out in the little town to which he had retired accompanied by all the escort that he had at his disposition what a rebuff that would be i shall be disgraced both here and at besancourt answered the abbe maslon if he appears among my clergy a janus cyst of the lord whatever you can say my dear abbe replied monsieur de renal i'll never expose the administration of verrieres to the receiving with such an affront from monsieur de la mole you do not know him he is orthodox enough at court but here in the provinces he is a satirical wit and cynic whose only object is to make people uncomfortable he is capable of covering, covering us with ridicule in the eyes of the liberals simply in order to amuse himself it was only on the night between the saturday and the sunday after three whole days of negotiations that the pride of the abbe maslon bent before the fear of the mayor which was now changing into courage it was necessary to write a honeyed letter to the abbe chalon begging him to be present at the ceremony in connection with the relic of bray la hole if of course his great age and his infirmity allowed him to do so m chalon asked for and obtained a letter of invitation for julien who was to accompany him as his subdeacon from the beginning of the sunday morning thousands of peasants began to arrive at the neighbouring mountains and to inundate the streets of verrieres it was the finest sunshine finally at about three o'clock a, th a thrill swept through this crowd a great fire had been perceived on a rock two leagues from verrieres this signal announced that the king had just entered the territory of the department at the same time the sound of all the bells and the repeated volleys from an old spanish cannon which belonged to the town testified to its joy at this great event half the population climbed to the roofs all the women were on the balconies the guard of honour started to march the brilliant uniforms were universally admired everybody recognized a relative or a friend they made fun of the timidity of monsieur de moreau whose prudent hand was ready every single minute to catch hold of his saddle-bow but one remark resulted in all the others being forgotten the first cavalier in the ninth line was a pr very pretty slim boy who was not recognized at first he soon created a general sensation as some uttered a cry of indignation and others were dumbfounded with astonishment they recognized in this young man who was sitting uh, one of the norman horses of m valenod little sorel the carpenter's son there was a unanimous outcry against the mayor above all on the part of the liberals what because this little laborer was masqueraded as an abbe was tutor to his brats he had the audacity to nominate him guard of honor to the prejudice of rich manufacturers like so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so? those gentlemen said a banker's wife ought to put that insolent gutter boy in his proper place he is cunning and carries a sabre answered her neighbor her neighbor he would be dastardly enough to slash them in the face the conversation of aristocratic society was more dangerous the ladies began to ask each other if the mayor alone was re responsible for this grave impropriety 
Speaking generally, they did justice to his contempt for lack of birth. Julian was the happiest of men while he was the subject of so much conversation. Bold by nature, he sat a horse better than the majority of young men of his mountain town. He saw that in the eyes of the woman, he was the topic of interest. His epaules were more brilliant than those of others because they were new. His horse pranced at every moment. He reached the zenith of joy. His happiness was unbounded when, as they passed by the old rampart, the noise of the little cannon made his horse prance outside the line. By a great piece of luck, he did not fall. From that moment, he felt himself a hero. He was one of Napoleon's officers of artillery and was charging a battery. One person was happier than he. She had first seen him pass from one of the folding windows in the Hotel de Ville. Then, taking her carriage and rapidly making a long detour, she arrived in time to shudder when his horse took him outside the line. Finally, she put her carriage to the gallop, left by another gate of the town, succeeded in rejoining the route by which the king was to pass, and was able to follow the guard of honor at twenty paces distance in the midst of noble dust six thousand peasants cried long live the king when the mayor had the honor to harangue his majesty an hour afterwards when all the speeches had been listened to and the king was going to enter the town the little cannon began again to discharge its spasmodic volleys but an accident ensued the victim being not one of the cannoners who had proved their medal at leipzig and Montreux, but the future deputy mayor, Monsieur de Moreau. His horse gently laid him in one heap of mud on the high road, a somewhat scandalous circumstance inasmuch as it was necessary to extricate him to allow the king to pass. His majesty alighted at the fine new church, which was decked out today with all its crimson curtains. The king was due to dine and then afterwards take his carriage again and go and pay his respects to the celebrated relic at saint clement scarcely was the king in the church when julian galloped towards the house of monsieur de renal once there he doffed with a sigh his fine sky-blue uniform his sabre and his epaules to put on again his shabby little black suit he mounted his horse again and in a few moments was at bray le haut which was on the summit of a very pretty hill enthusiasm is responsible for these numbers of peasants thought julian it's impossible to move a step at verrieres and here there were more than ten thousand around this ancient abbey half ruined by the vandalism of the revolution it had been magnificently restored since the restoration and people were already beginning to talk of miracles julian rejoined the abbe chalon who scolded him roundly and gave him a cassock and a surplice he dressed quickly and followed Monsieur Chalon, who was going to pay a call on the young bishop of Agde. He was a nephew of Monsieur de Molay, who had been recently nominated and had been charged with the duty of showing the relic to the king, but the bishop was not to be found. The clergy began to get impatient. It was awaiting its chief in the sombre Gothic cloister of the ancient abbey. Twenty-four curés had been brought together so as to represent the ancient chapter of bray le which before 1789 consisted of twenty-four canons. The curés, having deplored the bishop's youth for three-quarters of an hour, thought it fitting for their senior to visit Monseigneur to apprise him that the king was on the point of arriving and that it was time to betake himself to the choir the great age of monsieur chalon gave him the seniority in spite of the bad temper which he was manifesting to julien he signed him to follow julien was wearing his surplice with distinction by means of some trick or other ecclesiastical dress he had made his fine curling hair very flat but by a forgetfulness which redoubled the anger of monsieur chalon the spurs of the guard of honour could be seen below the long fold of his cassock when they arrived at the bishop's apartment, the tall lackeys, with their lace frills, scarcely deigned to answer the old curé to the effect that Monseigneur was not receiving. They made fun of him when he tried to explain that in his capacity of senior member of the chapters bray le he had the privilege of being admitted at any time to the officiating bishop. Julian's haughty temper was shocked by the lackey's insolence. He started to traverse the corridors of the ancient abbey and to shake all the doors which he found. 
A very small one yielded to his efforts, and he found himself in the cell in the midst of Monseigneur's valets, who were dressed in black suits with chains on their necks. His hurried manner made these gentlemen think that he had been sent by the bishop, and they let him pass. He went some steps further on and found himself in an immense Gothic hall, which was extremely dark and completely wainscoted in black oak. The windows had all been walled in with brick except one. There was nothing to disguise the coarseness of his masonry, which offered a melancholy contrast to the ancient magnificence of the woodwork. The two great sides of this hall, so celebrated among Burgundian antiquaries and built by the Duke Charles the Bold, about 1470 in expiation of some sin, was adorned with richly sculptured wooden stalls. All the mysteries of the apocalypse were to be seen portrayed in wood of different colors. This melancholy magnificence debased as it was by the sight of the bare bricks and the plaster, which was still quite white, affected Julian. He stopped in silence. He saw at the other extremity of the hall near the one window which was in daylight a movable mahogany mirror. A young man in a violet robe and a lace surplice, but with his head bare, was standing still three paces from the glass. This piece of furniture seemed strange in a place like this, and had doubtless been only brought there on the previous day. Julian thought that the young man had the appearance of being irritated. He was solemnly giving benediction with his right hand close to the mirror. What can this mean, he thought? Is this young priest performing some preliminary ceremony? Perhaps he is the bishop's secretary. He will be as insolent as the lackeys never mind though let us try he advanced and traversed somewhat slowly the length of the hall with his gaze fixed all the time on the one window and looking at the young man who continued without any intermission bestowing slowly an infinite number of blessings the nearer he approached the better he could distinguish his manner the richness of the last surplice stopped julian in spite of himself some paces in front of the mirror it is my duty to speak he said to himself at last but the beauty of the hall had moved him and he was already upset by the harsh words he anticipated the young man saw him in the mirror turned around and suddenly discarding his angry manner said to him in the gentlest tone well monsieur has it been arranged at last julian was dumbfounded as the young man began to turn towards him julian saw the pectoral cross on his breast it was the bishop of agde as young as that thought julian at most six or eight years older than i am he was ashamed of his spurs monseigneur he said at last i am sent by monsieur chalon the senior of the chapter ah he has been well recommended to me said the bishop in a polished tone which doubled julian's delight but i beg your pardon monseigneur monsieur i mistook you for the person who was to bring me my mitre it was badly packed at paris the silver cloth towards the top has been terribly spoiled it will be awful ended the young bishop sadly and besides i am being kept waiting monseigneur i will go and fetch the mitre if your grace will let me julian's fine eyes did their work go monsieur said the bishop with charming politeness i need it immediately i am grieved to keep the gentlemen of the chapter waiting when julian reached the centre of the hall he turned round towards the bishop and saw that he had again commenced giving benedictions what can it be julian asked himself no doubt it is a necessary ecclesiastical preliminary for the ceremony which is to take place when he reached the cell in which the valets were congregated he saw the mitre in their hands these gentlemen succumbed in spite of themselves to his imperious look and gave him monseigneur's mitre he felt proud to carry it as he crossed the hall he walked slowly he held it with reverence he found the bishop seated before the glass but from time to time his right hand although fatigued still gave a blessing julian helped him to adjust his mitre the bishop shook his head ah it will keep on he said to julian with an air of satisfaction do you mind going a little way off then the bishop went very quickly to the centre of the room and approached the mirror again resumed his angry manner and gravely began to give blessings julian was motionless with astonishment he was tempted to understand but did not dare the bishop stopped and suddenly abandoning his grave manner looked at him and said what do you think of my mitre monsieur is it on right quite right monseigneur 
it is not far back that would look a little silly but i mustn't on the other hand wear it down over the eyes like an officer's shako it seems to me to be on quite right the king is accustomed to a venerable clergy who was who are doubtless very solemn i should not like to appear lacking in dignity especially by reason of my youth and the bishop started again to walk about and give benedictions it is quite clear said julian daring to understand at last he is practising giving his benediction i am ready the bishop said after a few moments go monsieur and advise the senior and the gentlemen of the chapter soon monsieur chalon followed by the two eldest cures entered by a big man magnificently sculptured door which julian had not previously noticed but this time he remained in his place quite at the back and was only able to see the bishop over the shoulders of ecclesiastics who were presenting at the door in the crowds the bishop began slowly to traverse the hall when he reached the threshold the cures formed themselves into a procession after a short moment of confusion the procession began to march intoning the psalm the bishop who was between monsieur chalon and the very old cure was the last to advance julian being in attendance on the abbe chalon managed to get quite near monseigneur they followed the long corridors of the abbey of bray la -Haut. in spite of the brilliant sun they were dark and damp they arrived finally at the portico of the cloister julian was dumbfounded with admiration for so fine a ceremony his emotions were divided between thoughts of his own ambition which had been reawakened by the bishop's youth and thoughts of the latter's refinement and exquisite politeness this politeness was quite different to that of monsieur de renal even on his good days the higher you lift yourself towards the first rank of society said julian to himself the more charming manners you find they entered the church by a side door suddenly an awful noise made the ancient walls echo julian thought they were going to crumble it was the little piece of artillery again it had been drawn at a gallop by eight horses and had just arrived immediately on its arrival it had been run out by the leipzig cannoneers and fired five shots a minute as though the prussians had been the target but this admirable noise no longer produced any effect to julian he no longer thought of napoleon and the military glory to be bishop of agde so young he thought but where is agde how much does it bring in two or three hundred thousand francs perhaps monseigneur's lackeys appeared with a magnificent canopy monsieur chalon took one of the poles but as a matter of fact it was julian who carried it the bishop took his place underneath he had really succeeded in looking old and our hero's admiration was now quite unbounded what can't one accomplish with skill he thought the king entered julian had the good fortune to see him at close quarters the bishop began to harangue him with unction without forgetting a little nuance of very polite anxiety for his majesty we will not repeat a description of the ceremony of bray la -Haut. they filled all the columns of the journals of the department for a fortnight on end julian learnt from the bishop that the king was descended from charles the bold at a later date it was one of julian's duties to check the accounts of the cost of this ceremony monsieur de la mot who had succeeded in procuring a bishopric for his nephew had wished to do him the favor of being himself responsible for all the expenses the ceremony alone at bray la cost three thousand eight hundred francs after the speech of the bishop and the answer of the king his majesty took up a position underneath the canopy and then knelt very devoutly on a cushion near the altar the choir was surrounded by stalls and the stalls were raised two steps from the pavement it was at the bottom of these steps that julian sat at the feet of monsieur de chalon almost like a train-bearer sitting next to his cardinal in the sixteen chapel at rome there was a te deum floods of incense innumerable volleys of musketry and artillery the peasants were drunk with happiness and piety a day like this undoes the work of a hundred numbers of the jacobean papers julian was six paces from the king who was really praying with devotion he noticed for the first time a little man with a witty expression who wore an almost plain suit but he had a sky-blue ribbon over this very simple suit he was nearer the king than many other lords whose clothes were embroidered with gold to such an extent that to use julian's expression it was impossible to see the cloth 
he learned almost minutes later it was monsieur de la mole he thought he looked haughty and even insolent i'm sure this marquis is not so polite as my pretty bishop he thought ah, the ecclesiastical calling makes the men mild and good but the king has come to venerate the relic and i don't see a trace of the relic where has saint clement got to it a little priest who sat next to him informed him that the venerable relic was at the top of the building in a chapelle ardente what's a chapelle ardente said julian to himself but he was reluctant to ask the meaning of the word he redoubled his attention the etiquette of the occasion of a visit of a sovereign prince is that the canons do not accompany the bishop but as he started on his march to the chapelle ardente my lord bishop of agde called the abbe Chalon. julian dared to follow him having climbed up a long staircase they reached an extremely small door whose gothic frame was magnificently gilded his work looked as though it had been constructed the day before twenty-four young girls belonging to the most distinguished families in verrieres were assembled in the front door the bishop knelt down in the midst of these pretty maidens before he opened the door while he was praying aloud they seemed unable to exhaust their admiration for this fine lace his gracious mien and his young and gentle face this spectacle deprived our hero of his last remnants of reason at this moment he would have fought for the inquisition and with a good conscience the door suddenly opened the little chapel was being blazing with light more than a thousand candles could be seen before the altar divided into eight lines and separated from each other by bouquets of flowers the suave odor of the purest incense eddied out from the door of the sanctuary the chapel which had been newly gilded was extremely small but very high julian noticed that there were candles more than fifteen feet high above the altar the young girls could not restrain a cry of admiration only the twenty-four young girls the two curés and julian had been admitted into the little vestibule of the chapel soon the king arrived followed by the monsieur de la mole and his great chamberlain the guards themselves remained outside kneeling and presenting arms his majesty precipitated rather than threw himself onto the stool it was only then that julian who was keeping close to the gilded door received over the bare arm of a young girl the charming statue of saint clement it was hidden under the altar and bore the dress of a young roman soldier it was a large wound on its neck from which the blood seemed to flow the artist had surpassed himself the eyes which though dying were full of grace were half closed a budding moustache adored the charming mouth which though half closed seemed notwithstanding to be praying the young girl next to julian wept warm tears at the sight one of her tears fell on julian's hand after a moment of prayer in the profoundest silence that was only broken by the distant sound of bells of all the villages within the radius of ten leagues the bishop of agde asked the king's permission to speak he finished a short but very touching speech with a passage the very simplicity of which assured its effectiveness never forget young christian women that you have seen one of the greatest kings of the world on his knees before the servants of this almighty and terrible god these servants feeble persecuted assassinated as they were on earth as you can see by the still bleeding wounds of saint clement will triumph in heaven you will remember them my young christian women will you not this day for ever and will detest the infidel who will be for ever faithful to this god who is so great so terrible but so good with these words the bishop rose authoritatively you promise me he added lifting up his arm with an inspired air we promise said the young girls melting into tears i accept your promise in the name of the terrible god added the bishop in a thunderous voice and the ceremony was at an end the king himself was crying it was only a long time afterwards that julian had sufficient self-possession to inquire where were the bones of the saint that had been sent from rome to philip the good duke of burgundy he was told that they were hidden in a charming waxen figure his majesty deigned to allow the young ladies who had accompanied him into the chapel to wear a red ribbon on which were embroidered these words hate of the infidel perpetual adoration monsieur de la mole had ten thousand bottles of wine distributed among the peasants 
In the evening at Verrieres, the liberals made a point of having illuminations which were a hundred times better than those of the royalists. Before leaving, the king paid a visit to Monsieur de Moreau. End of chapter 18